Hello, we're here with City Attorney Pete Holmes, who's running for re-election. Would you like to go ahead with your two minutes? You bet. Thank you, uh, Chair Gomez. I, uh, again, appreciate your time here. This is really public service at its best. And uh, believe me, your efforts are, are not unnoticed. You know, I'm, I'm running for an unheard of fourth term. Well, in recent history, certainly in Seattle. Uh, all three prior times I have enjoyed the 36 endorsement. And I think that it's, it's uh, one that I've been particularly proud of. It's ironic, I actually have drawn an opponent at this time who I believe is from the 36th district. I've never, never met the gentleman before, but uh, it's, it's only one of the reasons though why this endorsement is so important to me. You know, I turned 65 and as a result of that, one of the blessings is about uh, this Wednesday, I'll be three weeks out since I've had my second in, uh, vaccination. So, you know, the privileges of reaching 65. Uh, but I also feel that, you know, while I, I had thought about, is it time to call three terms uh, a career with the city? It's also, I think, the most important time in the city's history. Uh, I have accomplished a lot. You guys know me. You've seen me, uh, you know, walk the talk and actually put into action all the things that I've said. You know my history. There's still more to do. And I think that as I uh, run for reelection, if I'm fortunate to be uh, reelected, I will be serving alongside my sixth mayor. And together we'll be looking for my seventh chief of police. We'll be negotiating a new police contract with SPOG under what will be the eighth, ninth year uh, going on of the reforms under the federal consent decree. I can't think of a time that's been more important in the city's history that we have strong, steady leadership and continuity at City Hall. Uh, at the same time, I want to I want to caution that there there are there are concerns that we might fall back into old habits, the just lock them up mentality, doubling down on the war on drugs, and I'm concerned that there's a lot of lot of forces at work even in our wonderful city that are not really interested in building back better. Nice. And we have got to make sure we bring everyone along with us. So I'm simultaneously very excited and optimistic about Seattle's ability to rebound yeah, from the rebound, pandemic. Rebound. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, where I'm am, sorry, I, on where am I on the time? That's, that's time, sorry. Great, okay, got Great. it. Great, okay, got it. <laughs> All right. Um, I mean... All right, so I'm going to post question one into the chat, and uh, I have Barbara, Sherry, Alice, and then Mackenzie is the order. So Barbara, would you like to ask question one? Barbara, you are on mute. Barbara, you're muted still. All right, I, I, I'll go, there you go. Is that better? Yes. Can you, okay, great. So, um, uh, Nicole, I actually am not seeing question one in the in the chat. It's. Um, Here, let me do it again. I see it. There you go. So I'm sorry. Is so question one is, um, I'm not sure that I'm going to get this right. Is it, do you support and will you advocate for ending qualified immunity for law enforcement? I'm going to give you a yes and a no. Uh, that I do support it, but I cannot advocate for it while I simultaneously have a responsibility for defending law enforcement officers who are entitled to the defense right now. And I just wanna make sure you understand that when I took office, Seattle was 40 years into a contract with an outside private firm, no bid, exclusive contract where every police misconduct case went, no questions asked, and they were paid uh, win or lose by the hour. I terminated that contract and brought it in house where we have saved the city tens of millions of dollars and learned a heck of a lot about police misconduct. 
I think that that was the right move. And so for qualified immunity, it's clear it's a judge made rule. It can be changed by legislation, but it's very important if I'm going to hold my oath of office to the officers that we're defending when they're entitled to it now, that I not um, prejudice a jury and in any pending case that we might have and have it uh, quoted back. But it's clear there's room for improvement in the law. Great, thank you. Uh, question two, uh, Sherry. Do you support the city's sweeping of homeless encampments? If not, what concrete steps would you take to stop the sweeps? Well, well, first let's, um, let's discuss, uh, you know, life during the pandemic, of course, basically eviscerated the city's capacity to legally do cleanups of encampments because you simply cannot under Ninth Circuit law sweep, clean up, whatever you want to say about an encampment, unless you can offer the occupants a place to go. And with COVID, of course, that, that uh, destroyed our ability to use what were frankly inadequate shelters to begin with because they were in a congregate setting. So without that, you know, we simply cannot do it. We can't do it legally. I speak up and I make certain that we not do it. And so, um, you know, this is, I, I'll, I just want to close on this. We keep talking about homelessness, just the same way we talk, we talk about low level crime until we address the underlying causes of homelessness and some of these misdemeanor offenses that, can, that there's, there's a lot of repetition and recognize that we're not gonna be able to criminalize poverty. We're not gonna be able to criminalize mental health issues. We're not gonna be able to criminalize substance abuse addiction until we do that and finally fund the scale, the solutions that we know do work Things like sweeping encampments are just moving a problem around and just uh, it's, it's something that we're doing to satisfy a loud political voice. It's wrong. It's just wrong. I'm going to speak up whenever it's not legal, but, you know, at the end of the day, the mayor and the council have to make decisions about how they're going to execute these policies. Thank you. Uh, question number three, we have uh, Alice. <clears throat> Uh, yeah. Should the city change its approach to prosecuting misdemeanor offenses? Will you file charges for drug possession? Yes and no. Uh, so let's just be very clear on that. When I first ran, uh, taking the last question first back in 2009, I said I would never file another marijuana possession case. And I didn't. And I dismissed everyone that we had. Uh, people were shocked that I actually did what I said I was going to do, but I can promise you I will not file any drug possession cases. I don't fault the legislature, by the way, for not enacting the complete solution to the, to the failed war on drugs, given the fact that the Supreme Court ruled in the Blake decision in mid-session, and it just simply wasn't time. But I'm committed to making sure over the next two years we work on it. And yes, the city absolutely should change its approach to prosecuting misdemeanor crime. That's why I didn't shy away from the debate when we had the, the bill proposed by the Office of Public Defense to, uh, to create a necessity defense. Uh, it, they're absolutely talking about the right problems, the right questions. Why do we want to pretend that criminalizing poverty, substance abuse, addiction, and mental health issues is the way to go? It's wrongheaded. It's bad law. It's bad policy. How about that? That works. Uh, question number four. Uh, let's see here. We have Mackenzie. Great. Uh, do you support ranked choice voting for Seattle's elections? And what would you do to make ranked choice voting a reality in Seattle? I'm certainly interested in it. I'll, I'll confess, I don't know a lot of, I mean, I know what's involved about, you know, voting several times. So you don't have to worry about a runoff or about, you know, the, the, uh, a tight election. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, think it, I think it's an innovative idea, much like our democracy voucher program. I think that it's something we should look at. Um, I would pledge to absolutely support uh, studying it, uh, finding out on the council who would be interested in sponsoring a bill. I think we absolutely should look at it. Great, thank you. And so now we'll open it up to follow up questions and the responses to these are a minute apiece. Um, and I will ask board members to raise their hand if 
they have a follow-up question. Could I just ask Nicole how I'm doing on time? I'm sorry, oh, I'm trying sure, hard to follow time oh, and I hope I'm not you, eviscerating you, your- You've been great on all of the, the two minute responses. You've been um, early. Yeah, okay. and we have 10 minutes left. So Sarah, go ahead with your first question. Hi, um, Hi, Sarah. As someone that has worked on the state's litigation against Purdue Pharma and opioid distributors, I was hoping you could speak a little to the city's litigation, if any, against opioid manufacturers and distributors, and generally what your office is doing to address the opioid epidemic. You bet. Thanks for the question, Sarah. And Sarah, I'm looking forward to a time when you and I can actually go out and, and have a have a beer or coffee with uh, you know post pandemic to to catch up on things. But uh, yeah. let me, <laughs> you. Uh, you know, just in the last two weeks, I talked with uh, Attorney General Ferguson, uh, your boss, about that uh, uh, and about what. Uh, whether we should entertain seriously the Purdue Pharma uh, settlement offer. Uh, you know, there was the, the John Bolton famous comment about the drug deal with Ukraine under the Trump administration. And that's exactly what this is, is a damn drug deal where they offered to actually have the plaintiffs, the states and cities share in profits in an in a opioid manufacturer going forward. 15 seconds. And it's it's wrong. Uh, we shouldn't do it. We're rejecting it. Bob and I are both on the same page about that. Uh, I'm going to continue to press the litigation. Uh, I think that uh, you know personally, I think that the public would like to see the Sackler family do some jail time. But I'll stop it, rather than keeping all their billions of dollars of ill-gotten gain. Great. Thank you. Any other follow-up questions? Follow-up questions? Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, Pete, I know it's early, but I wonder um, what you can say about your new opponent and how would you distinguish your approach from what he's advocating? You know, Jeff, thanks. I, I really don't know uh, Steve Fortney at all. Uh, I know that he has been a Microsoft lawyer for the last two and a half years. Um, he, it's, it's, it's pretty slim what he has said about, uh, he thinks Seattle's heading in the wrong direction. Uh, that's every challenger better be able to work that into their opening statement, uh, at least, you know, uh, 30 seconds in. But beyond that, I'm not really clear what he wants. It seems like he has had a lot of unkind things to say about the council and the mayor, which kind of makes me wonder if, if perhaps he shouldn't be considering a council position. But, uh, you know, I, I honestly just don't know enough other than that he wants my job. And uh, I, you know, seconds. that's great. I, I have a, a four year job interview that's gonna go on for six months, that's fair. I'm not entitled to this job. I'm grateful he's gonna allow me to have a contrast. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I can go with one. So uh, I will give you a minute to talk about some work that you've done with neighboring cities. Um, what's, what's, uh, what comes to the top of your mind with, with some of that collaboration? Thanks, Nicole. You know, if there's been any upside to the Trump administration, it's that sister cities banded together. And, uh, you know, I, I'd say a, a great example of that, of that was when New York City Seattle and Portland all decided, you know, we should be filing here in the Western District to challenge the, uh, the label, the designation as anarchist jurisdictions. And so even though it took an election to finally undo it, we completely tied that up. And it, you should understand there were millions of dollars at stake. They were really pushing through with that. Um, the, the next thing I'd say is the lawsuit we filed on a number of jurisdictions that was trying to stop our race and social justice initiative training uh, the, and, and quoting the Reverend King about the, the work we were trying to do to go after institutional racism. That was an evil administration, sister cities banded together. We've gotten to know each other better and we've shared lots of, lots of information. Great, thank you. Any further questions? Uh, Sherry, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> what are your views on the, um, I'm not sure the right term for them, but I'll call them safe consumption sites. And um, especially in light of the uh, 
decision that came out in Pennsylvania. Which one? They 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 kind oh. of bounced around. <laughs> okay, well I'll let you you know more than me. <laughs> oh sure, sure. Yeah, no, Sherry, you you bet. Now shells or safe injection sites, whatever you'd like to call them, you know, to the extent that they're that they have been called for as a harm reduction technique by 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 public health professionals, I'm all in. Our biggest problem with the war on drugs was pretending that a public health crisis could be addressed by the criminal justice system. Uh, that's what was wrong. Lawyers' role now, today, is to help unwind it and make sure that we return public health problems to the public health arena. And that's why, when they, when I, to me, it makes sense. I'm not a doctor, Sherry, so I'm not a public health care uh, professional. But I am a legal professional, and I want to give it a shot because my city wants to give it a shot. The literature suggests that it is a good, sound uh, harm exactly. reduction method. So uh, if the city wants to move forward with this, I will fight tooth and nail to make sure that we resist all challenges. Okay, thank you. We have time for another question. All right, I, I have one. So um, throughout your time as city attorney, what would you, um, what are you most proud of um, uh, that you've done? You know, today I submitted my uh, UCFW, UFCW uh, questionnaire and they asked me to list 10 things and it was fun to kind of go at it in chronological order. But, you know, I, I think the, the, the main thing I wanna, I wanna touch on is what has happened in this last term. Um, it's one thing to come in and say, you're not gonna prosecute marijuana cases anymore. It's another thing to you know, stand in front of a microphone, microphone and, and proclaim you're a sponsor of an initiative to legalize marijuana. But when you lead an office where everyone from in the trenches is stepping forward with new ideas that's when you know you've provided the kind of leadership your department needs. And so the two examples I want to give you just in this pandemic year that have come forward, my civil division all on its own, not top down, assembled an incredible group to study the question of, of, of reparations for descendants of slavery. And they have now put on a program and assembled literature that is qualifies for an hour and a half of, of legal credit uh, continuing legal credit for lawyers. It is amazing. I challenge you not to get through it without crying. Uh, the other thing is on the criminal division. We've been trying to figure out how do we identify, you know, when you see a case, damn, all the elements are there. We could file that case, but something's not right. Why did this officer have six OPA cases for the same thing of pulling over someone that looks like it was driving while black? Can we put together uh, a, a panel, a review board, not just of lawyers, but of case prep workers, paralegals, legal assistants, and the prosecutors to say, I got this case, it's ready to be filed, but something doesn't look right. And they proposed it to me as a way to exercise prosecutorial discretion. And I said, I, I tear it up. I said, guys, I didn't ask them to do this. They put it together themselves. They put in hundreds of hours of time researching it, put together a charter. What do you think, Pete? I'm sorry, but that's when a leader is leaving the right mark, when it's spontaneous, it's organic, it's coming up. And I've never been so proud of my civil and criminal divisions pulling together. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna tear up now, but that's what I'm proud of. Marijuana legalization, the 365 day sentences, all of that. This, this is when now they're, they got it. They're public servants, they're servant leaders and they wanna make the world a better place. Thank you so much. I would have cut you off, but you're so passionate about it. But I, I know, I, 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 I would have given another minute for that one. <laughs> <laughs> right. exactly. I, I apologize. I got to say the, the, the warning is a little bit subtle and I've missed it. Yeah, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful okay. of your time. That's okay. No, no. 
I would have just given you an extra minute to finish that thought anyway. Well, I grew up in the 37th district, you know, and they used a cowbell to cut you off there. That was the <laughs> Summer, I'm really sorry, but we're at uh, almost at time. So uh, would you like to go ahead with your uh, one minute wrap up, Pete? You bet. I'll, I'll keep it very brief. Uh, again, I, I said I'm coming for this fourth term as a calling. Uh, I, there, there are other things that I have other interests that I have, but I love this city. My work's not done. And uh, I am anxious to make sure that a new mayor, a new police chief and the like, not to mention the fact that whoever fills uh, Lorena Gonzalez's seat now that she's stepped aside to run for mayor, that'll be my 30th council member. <laughs> and I've got to make sure that we that we hand over the reins. I, I'm, I, I'm not needed. I'm not uh, irreplaceable by any stretch, but I do think at this moment in time, I think that I have a lot to offer this city as it regains ground and builds back better. That's what I want to do. Great, thank you so much.